Thank you very much, uh, Sandeep. Uh, I'll now request Mr. G. V. Srinivas Murthy. Uh, he's a practicing, a practicing company secretary and also a fellow member of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India. He will be sharing a perspective from the law side. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, very good evening. It's great to see even at this uh, last session, uh, still probably 50, 60 percent of the uh, participants uh, for today's uh, event. It's been a great experience for me uh, since I was uh, there from morning to listen to all the youngsters who were very keen to do something uh, uh, to contribute to the society. Now, I would like to talk about uh, Uh, I'm a practicing company secretary by profession, started my career with State Bank of India, then worked with SBA Capital Markets for a few years. Uh, I have seen closely how people, particularly SME segment, uh, struggling to uh, carry on their business because any business venture would require definitely money and without that it is extremely difficult. And uh, large corporates uh, do, uh, I don't mind saying that, do exploit uh, SME segment. And uh, I thought that uh, I need to do something myself after working for about 15 years in the bank and then about for five years in SBA capital markets. I quit the job. I was married. I had a two-year-old son and a good job as an officer and, uh, uh, you know, a company secretary of SBA Capital Markets, when I put in my papers, people were telling me, what are you doing? You're having a great job and a secure job. I said, yes, uh, for me it was a secure job, but uh, when I see around me people struggling to raise funds to sustain themselves, I thought, uh, I think I need to do something uh, to contribute to them uh, in terms of advisory services, etc. That's how I uh, you know, came out of uh, employment in 1994, and I've been in practice uh, since 1994. My focus has been two areas. One is uh, corporate consulting. Uh, being a company secretary, I'm advisor to companies like uh, uh, Mercedes-Benz -Ben, uh, uh, Research and Development Services, Corsi, et cetera, where I do give consulting in corporate law. But uh, my passionate area is the finance, where I advise the SME segment, help them in raising funds. So this is a little bit of background. And uh, today's talk is on uh, the CSR initiative by the government of India and how it can help the social enterprises. And that is what I would like to just uh, touch upon in the next uh, probably five minutes. Yeah. Uh, let me just give the genesis of CSR. Uh, uh, we all know that uh, uh, the social responsibility has been there uh, uh, for ages. It's not that something which is new, which is being talked about. Way back in 1875, it is Mackay Company of New York City which contributed uh, funds to uh, often uh, uh, asylum. And uh, we, have, uh, we have also seen errors in terms of social um, service. Uh, it is... Uh, brought out by University of Michigan Business Review in 78, Patrick Murphy classified the CSR errors into four distinct uh, 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 categories. A period up to 1950, where the companies donated to charities. It was more of charity-oriented uh, uh, activity. Period uh, 51 to 67, the awareness error was uh, you know, uh, created, where companies recognized the responsibility in community affairs and uh, period 68 to 73 it became an issue error because uh, there uh, there has been development industrial development a lot of activities which contributed to the problems ills and uh, companies focused on uh, areas like urban decay pollution problems etc cetera, etc cetera. and period after 73 now the period what we are seeing and witnessing is treated as or called as responsive era where companies have started taking a very serious view of what they need to do in terms of uh, 
uh, having an approach, holistic approach at the board level itself. So there is a lot of uh, changes which are taking place in the board. They're bringing in uh, people who are uh, able to understand what uh, the responsibility of the corporation should be in terms of uh, contributing to the society and examining corporate ethics and lastly using social performance uh, 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 disclosures. Now, uh, I was surprised myself when I saw that uh, there is an international standard for SR activities, social responsibility activities. International Organization for Standardization has brought out the uh, ISO standard, which is ISO 26000, or in short, ISO SR, in the year 2010. And what is the goal of this standardization? The goal is to contribute to global sustainable development and to encourage business and other organizations to practice social responsibility and to improve impact on their workers, on the natural environment, and the communities. So it's a voluntary guideline, uh, it's not mandatory. And what does it do? It encourages companies to report to their stakeholders, get the feedback on the action taken by the corporates, and then improve their social responsibility. Now, seven key principles of IS-426000 is accountability, transparency, ethical behavior, respect for shareholders' interest, respect for rule of law, respect for international norms of behavior, respect for human rights. These are the key seven principles. And what is the objective? Seven objectives are organizational governance, human rights, labor practices, environment, fair operating practices, consumer issues, community involvement, and development. So we have a uh, ISO standard for this. Now. There are a number of public sector undertakings which are practicing the three pillars of sustainability, which is people, planet, and profit. In the morning session, we have heard a number of speakers. Uh, particularly, I was impressed with uh, Mrs. Rao's uh, uh, video clippings. Uh, how true it is, we are destroying our nature. Unfortunately, uh, corporates do not give a damn about the nature and the environment in which we are living. Uh, Thankfully, public sector undertakings are uh, giving a lot of stress on this uh, triple bottom line approach, which is people, planet, and profit. And it is uh, deep rooted in Netherlands. I think uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Kejriwal was mentioning about Netherlands uh, having their role in, I think, some of these initiative in Bangalore, right? Uh, uh, you said uh, uh, this uh, uh, in. Uh, HSR layout when you saw the cleaning up, etc. There was some mention about the Netherlands. Okay. Swedish company. Okay. Okay. Spread across. I mean, uh, the world over, uh, there is a lot of concern for uh, environment, but unfortunately, which is lacking in India. So that's one of the important uh, uh, aspects which public sector undertakings, uh, from my experience, uh, I have seen. Then what is the Indian scenario? Now, I have classified into two categories of the uh, approach to this whole CSR. One is uh, before the enactment of Companies Act 2013, which was just uh, introduced uh, in September 2013 uh, in, in two phases. The first phase was in September 2013, and the second phase was from 1st uh, April 2014. And the CSR has uh, found its uh, place in the uh, legislation from 1st April 2014. Now, uh, before this uh, 2013 Act uh, came into picture, we had the uh, initiative by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, asking the corporates to adopt some of these best practices in terms of their contribution to the society. So they came up with, uh, uh, you know, voluntary guidelines in 2009, and the guidelines uh, required formulation of policy by the board of directors of the company, and it covered six areas. One is care for all stakeholders, because the concept of uh, shareholder value has given way to stakeholder 
uh, uh, you know, welfare. Now, stakeholders, as we are all aware, are shareholders, employees, customers, suppliers, project affected people, society at large. So, the objective was to create value for all. Now, the second uh, uh, aspect was ethical functioning. And uh, ethical functioning was supposed to be uh, reflected in uh, governance systems and the underpinnings uh, was supposed to be ethics, transparency, and accountability. Uh, the third aspect was respect for the workers' rights and welfare. So it was to provide a, a workplace which is safe, uh, then hygienic, and humane. The fourth one was respect for environment. Now, to check and prevent pollution, then see that uh, recycling was possible, reduce waste, efficient use of energy, environmental friendly technology. The fifth was respect for human rights. So uh, the government thought that there was so much of uh, human rights violation both within the organization, uh, organization and outside the organization. So they wanted it to be brought into the fore and uh, they expected the corporates to not only see that uh, the human uh, exploitation is not there within their organization, but even outside it. And lastly, the social uh, uh, inclusive development. So it was on economic and social development of communities, geographical areas where they were operating, education, skill building, healthcare, etc. Okay. Uh, but there is a very interesting contrast. If you see the initiative which was uh, supposed to be voluntary uh, before this act came into uh, force, uh, the government said that the companies were to allocate budget for CSR activities uh, in any of the following ways, either link it to profit or link it to cost of the project or any other uh, you know, suitable uh, parameter which the corporate could think of. So there was no mandatory spend per se, and there was no yardstick how it should be taken forward. Then the reporting part was through their website or through annual report or through other communication media about their CSR policies, CSR activities, or progress. Now, you look at the scenario after the new act has come into force. It is a good uh, uh, makeover from the earlier policy, which was voluntary, and here, the CSR spend has been more or less mandatory. Uh, what the law says is either you spend or you explain. So uh, corporates are forced to uh, uh, you know, tell their uh, uh, stakeholders uh, whether they are spending on the activity, if not why. So that is one good thing. And secondly, uh, there is a computation method, so I don't want to get into technical aspects of it. Let me skip to the third aspect, second aspect, which is CSR committee. Now, CSR committee is mandatory in all companies, uh, which uh, Mr. Avinash was mentioning in terms of either net worth or turnover or the profit. Now, the best part which I love in that uh, enactment is that even a, a medium-sized enterprise, if it is making a profit of five crore plus, they are now uh, made accountable to society through CSR spend. Now, every company will have to have, apart from the board of directors, a CSR committee within the organization. The objective is that the CSR committee will have to come up with the projects or programs. Then they have to recommend to the board of directors, and the board will have to approve the policies or programs which are recommended to them and monitor the implementation. Now. The act also permits the corporations to either implement the CSR through their own company uh, as a vertical, as a department. Their employees can implement the projects or programs which are envisaged by the corporation, or they can also outsource this activity to a non-profit organization. It could be a trust or it could be a Section 8 company, which is non-profit uh, uh, company. Uh, but uh, when you outsource, you need to be careful. The company or the trust should be having a track record of three years in the space of uh, CSR activity. Now, another important aspect which is brought out in the legislation is that the board of directors will have to be accountable. They need to report in their, in their report to the shareholders. Now, what is that CSR activity they have 
any such? What is the progress? How much has been spent? And if they have not spent fully, what is the reason for not spending? So it, it also creates some sense of uh, seriousness on the part of the board to see that the CSR activity is implemented in true uh, spirit. Now, I'm, I'm focusing on this particular slide. The reason is from morning I was also listening to all the entrepreneurs, uh, you know, startups and social entrepreneurs. Their worry is very finance, very support, okay? Now, if you look at the activities and from the presentations, what I had seen from morning, you talk of waste management, you talk of sanitation and drinking water, you talk of renewable energy, talk of energy saving tubes, bulbs, education, skill development, civil and other infrastructure, healthcare, agroforestry, setting, uh, setting up and running libraries, sport equipment, and various activities. All of these are covered under CSR, and it need not be a restrictive interpretation of what these activities could be. The government has come out with uh, clarification. They say that you can interpret very liberally. As long as uh, the activities contribute to the good of the society, you need not worry. So this is one area which has opened up, uh, opened up floodgates of opportunities for social enterprises. And the figures which were mentioned by Avinash uh, during his presentation of 20,000 crores on CSR spend is only from the perspective of large corporates. But if you take the total spend which is required in one year is something like 40,000 crores. You know, we can imagine the kind of funds which are available. Now here, let me just add a small, uh, uh, you know, uh, a small idea which we are contemplating, uh, we are working, and we are, it is on the drawing board. Uh, as we have seen, the CSR initiative has been very fragmented, very uh, you know narrow in approach. Uh, a corporate can just do some uh, you know support for education. Some other corporate will focus on healthcare. Now, it's all uh, it's not uh, happening in a place where you can see the integrated approach, holistic approach. It's all happening in bits and pieces. So you'll not be able to see the real impact if you want to see. And uh, uh, particularly, uh, we are seeing a lot of migration to cities. And we have seen how the uh, city of Bangalore has decayed over years. And uh, I'm sure all of you who are Bangaloreans, you will agree with me. There used to be uh, you know, winter sweater sales and everybody had to wear a sweater from probably August onwards. And today in December, when I go for my war, uh, morning walk, I just wear my ordinary T-shirt. There is no need for you know, a sweater or a pullover. Now, that is a kind of environment uh, damage we have seen. Now, uh, what we are thinking as consultants and legal professionals and accounting professionals, a couple of us, we have, we have an organization also called uh, Sri Gem Corporate Services. We have on drawing board an integrated approach for CSR activity. We are planning to tap uh, large corporates, and we would like to bring within the umbrella uh, the social enterprises, uh, you know, who are uh, uh, who are very passionate uh, passionate about what they are doing, and we want to take this not in the cities. We want to go away from cities, go to probably tier two, tier three cities. Look at all these possibilities from waste management convert waste management into uh, probably compost, then give it to free to the farmers, set up old age homes, okay? Set up education facilities, set up healthcare facilities as a composite approach so that we can see the impact in one place. If you are successful in implementing in a village or a probably a, a town which is a little bigger than village, I'm sure uh, once we can showcase that in one center, we'll be able to replicate this across probably the state and country. Now with that, I would like to just uh, conclude my presentation. Probably we'll have some question answers. Uh, you are all free to you know, share your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. We'll take the questions during the panel. So I'll now request the rural BPO model, and today he's going to share uh, the details of the Data Halli initiatives which are being driven. 
Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm hoping I'm the last speaker, so it's my responsibility to you know get your attention. And uh, so I'm not going to give you a lot of scary slides, a lot of text. I'm going to tell you a very short and simple story about the real impact of CSR, um, what's actually happening on the ground. Um, the the good thing, uh, the beauty of CSR is there's money. So money can help you fuel your dreams. It can help you, you know, give wings to your passion. So JSW Foundation is one of the largest foundations in India, and I'm very proud and happy to be representing them today. So JSW has varied interest in steel, cement, infrastructure, ports, and IT business. Um, so I'm going to tell you about Data Halli, um, which is actually how does this go ahead? So that's why I hate PowerPoints. I think you can make a great point without the PowerPoint. OK, yeah. So, so we go back to 2005. Um, so I can proudly say that Data Halli is India's first woman-only rural BPO. We set it up way back in 2005. So now we're talking about in 2014 about rural BPO being a business model for IT BPO industry, being a low-cost delivery option for you know, tier one BPOs. That did not exist in 2005. So the entire intention of Data Halli was to give back to the society. If I go back to Chinmay's slide about who's spending more in CSR, I was very happy to see the steel companies are spending the most. And we are doing a bit, we are doing a part. So way back in 2005, um, JSW Steel Plant was opening up in Bellari, uh, North Karnataka. So the option was to either write a check to the community or do something about it. So there are a lot of options when it comes to CSR. You can spend in health, you can spend towards environment, you can spend towards women empowerment, you can spend towards a lot of other aspects. So why did this a concept of rural BPO came about in 2005? Uh, Mrs. Sangeeta Jindal is the chairperson of JSW Foundation. She's pretty passionate about women empowerment. So JSW being a $15 billion conglomerate had a lot of back office operations coming out. So it was a perfect marriage of using back office operations and giving women some livelihood. Why the women? In Bellari, the, the demographics say that the men have uh, very lucrative jobs in terms of they, they, they drive trucks to ferry the iron ore from you know, the, the mines to the, to the steel plant. They can earn close to 20,000 rupees a month. Um, they, they can get a job in the plant, they can earn a lot, they can do metallurgy courses and they can earn a lot. But what about the women? So the women, the girls, uh, they had no other option but to sit at home, look after children, and uh, basically do you know, domestic chores. So here was an opportunity for us to use our infrastructure, to use our money, and give back to the society, especially the women. So that, that's how we created Data Halli. Um, I mean, obviously, Halli in, in Canada means village, and data means and data is an English word. So, so that's the concept. So, the challenge in front of us was to how do we train them? How do you take rural women and girls straight from the villages, from the households, and make them do BPO work, make them do IT-related work? So, the, it was a long road where you know we had to invest a lot on training. These girls never saw a computer. They never saw an AC before. They never knew that you know there, there is work done, uh, work to be done by sitting in an office. So th this was an interesting challenge for us. So what we did is we invested in training. It was a four-month training where they knew about English, how to read, comprehend, and mind you, the background of these girls were that they had done the tenth, but they were just sitting at home. So this was an opportunity for us to use their talent to get our back office done. So we started doing simple activities like data entry, give them spreadsheets, let them take our financial 
you know, reports or invoices or you know, vouchers and get them entered into an Excel sheet. That was the most basic stuff uh, that could have been done. So thankfully, we had a good patron in terms of, in the form of ICIC Bank. They came forward and they said, can you digitize our checks? So we had a lot of checks coming from ICIC Bank. And then the team grew. Now we realize that we need more people. So we started hiring more people, more girls to be specific, more women. So now we had a 50-member team doing digitization of checks for ICIC Bank, putting that in Excel, and they had a turnaround, and they were working under pressure. So we're looking at a transformation of rural girls who were just you know, sitting at home. Now they're doing work for a, for a large uh, MNC bank. Um, so that was sometime, you know, one year, 2006, 2007. So if, you just, if I just fast forward from 2007 to 2014, where we are today is we have two centers. We have close to 300 seats and employing 600 women in Bellari region alone. So what we're looking at going forward is we're looking at multiplying the strength. This is a huge case study. This is a huge success. And we want to employ more and more women into this kind of an activity. Um, I, I might not have those slides. JSW has a lot of plants across India. We have cement plant in Andhra. We have uh, energy plant in Himachal. We have uh, ports in Maharashtra. So we, in fact, I'm also part of that uh, uh, team which is conceptualizing, can we replicate this model across India? Wherever JSW is located, wherever Jindal uh, Steel is located, can we replicate this model and give more and more opportunities to, opportunities to women and girls in that area? So I'm extremely happy to report that we're opening our new BPO center uh, sometime this, this month in Ratnagiri district in Maharashtra. So this will have 50 seats and will give opportunity to close to 100 women and girls to, to be working out there in a similar kind of environment. Um, the challenges of a rural BPO are a social enterprise, a sustainability. CSR can fund you, can help you get the capex, can help you get the computers, the office set up. But what's next? How do you sustain that model? How do you ensure that it's profitable? And yes, uh, we, we do make profits in certain activities because we have come so far that we can go and approach US clients and tell them to give us work. At this current juncture, we have uh, healthcare, we have e-publishing, we have BFSI clients working um, across the globe. It's a fascinating story to, um, or, or a thing to see that, you know, girls from a rural background picking up the phone and talking to clients from the U.S. and helping them solve problems in their day-to-day -day work. Uh, we have one of the largest clients in terms of Tata Sky. If you, if you happen to call Tata Sky and you happen to press Canada or Telugu as an option, most probably those calls will land in our center, in our rural BPO. Um, so that's, that's the effect, that's real impact, what CSI can do, the, the, the money that these corporates have can do to the society. Um, and we, JSW Foundation is, is not a very, uh, you'll not see ads, you'll not hear much about us in print media or social media. We, we do things quietly, we believe in creating a revolution. So I'll tell you about the impact that has, um, that has uh, been created because of this rural BPO data Halli. Uh, the biggest impact on the ground when we speak and interview girls, a woman is, uh, strangely, what they tell us is they're able to find better grooms for themselves. They have a better choice in finding a better you know, suitor for themselves. That's the biggest impact, I believe. The second biggest impact what we have seen is the, the livelihood. Uh, in terms of adding to the income. What money they take from this rural BPU, it could be very less, maybe like 5,000, 6,000 rupees a month, that is really adding or doubling up the income in their households. So that's a real impact uh, to a household that is earning less than you know $100 a month, uh, $5,000 uh, rupees a month. So that's, that's real impact. In terms of some of the other impacts that this model has created is, in this last 10 years, NASCOM Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation have recognized these kind of models as impact sourcing models. If you, if, you, if, you, if you go to Google and just type this word impact sourcing, you will see a tons of research and white papers on this kind of model. 
and they are taking to Africa. They are taking to places where they believe um, it can really create an impact. The thing about an urban BPO versus a rural BPO is, if a guy works in a BPO, he takes some salary in his, um, you know, it's a certain salary that adds to his lifestyle. But if uh, a, 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 a woman from this kind of a background takes the salary, that really impacts their life. So that, that's the difference between a rural BPO and an urban BPO. The second biggest impact is reverse migration. We see a lot of people from this tier two cities and towns, tier, tier two, tier three, coming to Bangalore or coming to major metros to looking, looking for employment. So this has uh, put a check on that. So that's, that's again, a second impact. So uh, over these years, I'm very happy that this, this has come a long way. People have uh, recognized us. Uh, we won the Global Sourcing Council Award in New York in 2013. And 2014, NASCOM Foundation um, gave us the Social Innovation Honors Award. So we are, we are doing a small bit, um, a quiet revolution, I would say, in this space where we're marrying social causes, women empowerment, and technology to drive a real impact. Uh, in fact, the best the icing on the came, cake came when we were invited by the United Nations um, to open up a similar BPO in Gaza, in the, in the conflict-ridden uh, place in Gaza. They want to replicate this model and give um, employment and jobs to people who are affected because of the conflict. So that was really some um, acknowledgement. So, Having said that, uh, uh, we, we are not done yet. Because this model is sustainable. This model can be replicated. And uh, the beauty about uh, CSR is that it can fund those uh, dreams in different parts of the country. Um, so we have just begun. That's the, that's the bottom line is we have just begun. And there's a uh, lot more to be done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.